We are live, folks, on uh, What Do You Think on a, a Tuesday night. It is Tuesday, isn't it? We are at Tuesday night. Um, <laughs> I'm just chatting with some friends tonight, some really good mates, and we've I think we've spoken about a lot of the stuff we want to talk about already, so we're going to go over it again. But uh, I'm joined tonight by the amazing um, Mr. Tuff, Tuffy, down there below, and uh, a mate we met back in the 80s when he was uh, he, he, he spent his time coming up from Brisbane um, uh, coming up from Sydney to join us all here in our uh, little town of Brisbane, Mr. Glenn Bibmead. G'day, Glenn. How are you, mate? Hey, guys. How are you going? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah, How did you no, two I... guys meet? I met. Oh, I you met... go. Yeah, you go, Glenn. Okay. I reckon the first time I met Tuffy was I was doing a gig at the, is it the Metropole or the Metropolitan or whatever it was? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In yeah, the city. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. you'd just done a lunchtime gig. And yeah. I was setting up to do a one after you in the Arvo. But I thought yeah. it was funny because Tuffy was walking around to all the tables singing to people. And I thought... Acoustically. Cool. Yeah, yeah. No, no PA, nothing. Just, just yeah. like a bus And I thought, yeah. I thought, okay, that's sort of good. And then and then um, I saw, I used to see you at the port office because I used to play before you on Friday Arvos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a little while. And you used to play after me. You used to do the evenings, obviously. And um, yeah. And then I, I saw you you know, things like the Transcontinental and then we yeah. got to, to chatting and, and got to doing some recording. I remember I went to your place once over at Algister years ago. Yes, right. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But I think the first time I met you was at that gig at the Metropolitan or what was it called, the Metropole? The Metropolitan, I think it was, yeah. I don't think I it's came, even there now. Yeah. Part of the I came center, up in, wasn't it? Yeah. I came up in 88 and I probably started yeah. doing gigs in halfway through that year. Um, yes, I come to 88 as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I remember you were saying you came up from Melbourne, so we came up yeah. same time. And um, I was living out at out at Cara Lee, out near Ipswich Way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I remember the first few gigs I used to do were at, at the actually, you know, the first gig I ever did was is it the Full Moon used to be called the Osborne? Yeah, yeah. we've been yeah. playing there. That, 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 yeah, the Osborne. Yeah, that was the Mate, first gig a... I ever did in Brisbane. Mate, it's a yeah, different yeah. venue now from the old Osborne. <laughs> I know. I, pl I played there yeah. last year. I was up in Brisbane oh, okay. month and played yeah. the full yeah. game with my mate Alex. Yeah. Well, I, so the that... guys from the port office owned it at the time, so I did that as well. Right. It was rough as bags back in those days. Oh, yeah. It was a bit of a dump. And I remember I yeah. went up to the to the bar to get a drink because I'm from Sydney, right? Because you guys call them pots. <laughs> yeah. And I went up to get a beer. It's a midi. And, and I said, can I have a beer? And he said... Do you want a pot, mate? And I went, what? I thought he was trying to sell me drugs. <laughs> and I, and so I, you bought the drugs. <laughs> yeah, I said, no, yeah. I have to go. Yeah, there. forget the beer, just give me the pot. <laughs> so that was sort of, oh, okay, it's a pot. I said, yeah, no, don't yeah. worry about it. Just give us a red wine. <laughs> so, yeah. But mate, but so, we, yeah, that was we the let, gig I did. Yeah. We let you. Just a little while on the bench of it, mate. I used to get the bus in from LGS. I'd go with the guitar on the bus, go in there, do the gig, and get the guitar, jump back on the bus, get the bus home. It's That's classic. Funny. Oh, yeah. Well, it was the, it was my first, one of my first gigs. Yeah. yeah. Busking. Yeah. Did you ever do the, the Flying Nun? I did. Yeah. Yep. I did. Same year. Yeah. Same year. Yeah. I remember Greg, that was Greg my first, that was me my first that, gig. That old church. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. That was a great little gig. Yeah. That's really crazy, but no, it, it, like that was in Sydney and Melbourne, would have gone off. But it was just, yeah, yeah it's like so close to the city and stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm just going, Harris, I can't believe. Yeah. Yeah, 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 St. Paul's Tavern, yeah, St. Paul's Terrace, yeah, or Leichhardt Street, if I can get up to there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, jeez, yeah, um, we're in there, virtually in the same camp. Just uh, right, back in, <laughs> follow each other back, around. <laughs> Back in the back, back in more the mid eighties, Bona, remember Bonaparte's up the top of St Paul's Terrace? There? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bonaparte. Yeah. It that used to have this gig. gig too, didn't it? It's under, it had this underground gig more or less. So it was under the building, and um, you, you, it was a band gig, a full band gig, and the room would just chock out. And it was one of those gigs where the, the bar at the back of the room was just like these trestle tables with es eskies on it. And we would play up, we'd squash on stage, and it was like one of those ones where the air conditioning would just be coming down on you with water, just leaking water on you everywhere as you're trying to sing. <laughs> but it was so hot and sweaty and grotty, and it was such a good gig. It was just so much yeah. fun. Everyone was just packed in there. The energy was just so good. And 
there's a whole generation that hasn't seen that, you know, where you you got yeah. 150 people packed in a small space, the band's playing really loud, you got sweat just dripping off you because not only is the air conditioning coming down on you, the lights back then used to be hot. They weren't these lights they use now. You actually you, you did the sauna on stage and you, you lost like so many pounds each gig. But it was just an amazing vibe because the energy was shared by everybody in the room. That was to me, that was like the heyday of my band playing was in rooms like that where you just the, yeah. the audience were there, they were in your face. You were really loud in their face, and everyone just shared the energy. It was so good. It's like the old Norbert, me, that little fun part of the old Norbert. You probably have to get about 80 to 100 people in the joint that just pack out. So, did you do the crest as well, then? Did you just make it a crest? That was part of the. No, I, the you know what I did? Going. I did the little bar next to the crest, the little restaurant ah. bar. And I remember one night you were playing there with Keith, mm. and yeah. I was talking to you before my gig, and. and I never went in and saw your gig, but because I, I was playing the little, it was like a little restaurant next to it. Yeah, I know that was like a piano like an bar Indian sort of like restaurant. That. But, but um, I never did the main room of the crest. But, um, yeah, and I, but so I did. Was there talking about smoky and sweaty? <laughs> and was that, there something Jack? Was there something Jackson's one of the room there at that time? Yeah, Jackson. General Jackson's was down there. Oh, that's right, General and Jackson. Tuffy's, um, not Tuffy. Oh, sorry, mate. Um, Rusty used to play down there at the time, didn't he? That's right. He's doing that on TV for it, apparently. Yes, the TV, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Hey, hey Glenn, mate, um, we're here to talk to you. We've got our memories to share, but, mate, what, what's what's your story, mate? Tell us your, your, what's your how story? you came into this game. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's how'd, you, how'd you avoid arrest, you know? <laughs> no, I just, um, I got up in Sydney. Um, <laughs> that's a good noise. That's a good noise, okay. stuff. I don't know what you're doing there, but. <laughs> keep, keep yeah, going. the headphones is playing up. It's, it's dropped off the volume. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I grew up in that? Sydney and um, Good. and uh, had bands in the early 80s. I, I was playing with my brother, who was a drummer and singer, in bands when we were like, when I was like 14. And he was, he's two years younger, so he was 12. Little kids bands. And um, started doing it professionally when I was about 20. And had bands through the 80s in Sydney. We played five, six nights a week, all the sort of venues and stuff, just original bands when you used to play originals and people would come and What, what type of areas? Is that like Balmain or your suburbs or where were you? No, I think uh, places like... <laughs> just tell them to keep that down. Yeah. <laughs> That's, is that the... the yeah, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> is, is that the Valley vibe, Tuffy? Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> New York. Yeah. It's like New York, so you can spend every five minutes in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, no, we were, we were doing venues like Selena's at Coogee Bay. Um, uh, that the Coogee Bay's happened? Like, sorry? Yeah, Coogee Bay. Is that the Coogee Bay? Yep. Yeah. yeah. That um, was a big one, wasn't it? Yeah, the, uh, the Mona Vale Hotel, the Manly Vale, the Brighton Hotel, they're all run by this mob called Miller's. Yeah, right. Like chain of pubs. Um, she Sheila's so, at North Sydney, was that one, Sheila's? Yeah, North I did Sydney? that. That was owned by um, Kevin Jacobson and Cole Joy owned that place. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, Berry Street, North Sydney. Used to do Sheila's yeah, a bit. We, we um, toured down through there. And just, just pubs. And I mean, in those days, there was a pub in every suburb that had bands most yeah. nights of the week. Yeah. So you could work five, six nights a week and um, and make okay money, like, you know, eight to 900 bucks for a band mm. in those days. And we did that mm. five or six nights a week. And we had a guy with, who did the lights and a guy who did the sound. And we owned a little yeah. transit van we bought. Yeah. And um, my brother and I were the roadies. <laughs> mm. But you could do that when you're 20. Mm. And um, so we did all those gigs. And then out of the blue in about... 1986 87 this guy called me from brisbane called glenn murphy who i think you said you might have heard of his name nick i've heard yeah, I've he face to a name do you, do you remember yeah he was making story wasn't he yeah he did right so he he rang yeah, me the and said he rang me and said i've heard some of your demos i don't know where he heard them from and um, I think actually Harry Bruce, the bass player, might have given him some, who played with me in the early 80s. And um, 
Harry's played with, you know, Rene Gaia, Ozzy Crawl, and mm. he's still playing now. He's 73 or 75 or something. Um, and so he said, oh, this is great. If you come up to Brisbane, I can get your record deal and get you lots of gigs and this and that. And I went, all right. <laughs> so just packed up and moved to Brisbane in 1988 and went up there with my brother who was playing, who was playing drums, my brother Paul, and a guy from Sydney, a guitarist called C Steve Vizeshi, and I'd love to know where he's got to. Mm -hmm. And he was a great guitarist, but he was going to play bass in our band. And we had a three-piece band, and I think the first gig we did was at the Roxy in the Valley. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, and, nice, we did, yeah. and we did like the Mansfield Tavern, and we did Malula Bar Hotel or the Powerhouse or whatever it's called. We did about five or six gigs, and then the gig stopped, and then my brother went back to Sydney. <laughs> And Steve disappeared. I think he ended up going back in the end, and I stayed there for 10 years. So, Mate, to straighten out in your memory, I think the powerhouse would have been in Toowoomba, and Malulaba Hotel was Tomo's back then. Tomo's, that was it, Tomo's, yeah. That Tomo's, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was mate, the first all... band gig we did, and then that, then that was wow. the very first solo gig I ended up doing on Sunday Arvos at Tomo's. And I used to drive wow. from Caralee mm -hmm. to Malulaba. I'd leave at 10 in mm -hmm. the morning, get there at 12, or one or something set up, do my gig until four, pack up and get mm -hmm. home at 10 at night. And I did that every Sunday for about six months. Yeah. But back in those <laughs> for, days, for it, 125 it was not... five bucks. Well, it was not uncommon common back then for me to be doing 10, 10 gigs a week. You'd do this one every day and then you do two on um, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the gigs would just there all the time. And it was great training for your voice surviving for knowing how to work every type of crowd and i remember i can't remember the exact, exact dollars but i knew back then i was earning more than my friends who were doctors and lawyers by doing gigs it yeah. was like the work was there and we were playing all the time and we were talking a bit before too about um yeah hacho when he had his his agency down the coast you know before i was doing the solo work i really came out of school and got on end up on the circuit and Hutcho had set up a thing up here in Queensland where you guys are doing things locally in Sydney. Up here, we'd go from like Cairns to Townsville, Gladstone, yeah. Mackay, the whole thing all the time. And we play six or seven nights in each town. And you'd always have like an eight to 10 ton truck. You had a three man crew. You were playing in rooms that held 1,800 people. And you'd play five nights of the week. And then on the Friday night, you had to pull your system down because Ice House were coming through or Dragon were coming through and you'd support those bands that were coming through. And yeah. the education we got up here was just, the training was just so good from the circuit he had set up in those days. On the back of that, Shuri came into the scene and was doing a lot of bookings around the state as well. But we had agents back then who were Make, yeah, making their money by actually promoting the bands and putting working conditions in place that made it worthwhile for the bands. Yeah. That all changed severely when... 89, the I reckon. Well, yeah. the, pokies came, the pokies came in and then you had like all the hotel chains come in and the agents then started working for the hotel chains. They didn't work for the, for the artists anymore. Mate, did the same thing happen in Sydney or is it just a thing up here? I don't know. <laughs> um I think, I mean, when I first started doing gigs in Sydney, when I was started doing solo gigs, I was through an agency called The Agency. Before that, they were called Cordon Bleu. And um, I remember that. Actually, The Agency booked a lot of big yeah. bands, but um, I just did solo gigs in little pubs and wine bars and restaurants and stuff. As far as them working for the venue, uh, for the venues, I'm not sure. I think there was there was a lot of those big clubs used to have bookers that would do. Well, we I booked this venue, but they weren't necessarily agents. They were just some guy that, you know. And I remember years later when I was signed to John Woodruff, he was he started a, a company in Sydney called Dirty Pool in the seventies. That basically mm -hmm. he he used to he he discovered the Angels in in Adelaide, and you know they'd be playing at Maroubra Seals Club, which holds two thousand people, but they'd be getting two grand. And then and went, John, oh, John became a big on. publisher, didn't he? Yeah, well, he signed Savage Garden and and. Yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah, yeah, hit the big time. So he sort of basically he, he signed you at about the same time, didn't he? Did he sign you? You, you, you did a single with him, didn't you? Maybe I did, did, I, I did a, an album and um, that never got released. We um, he signed me in 1998, so it was a couple of years yeah. after Savage Garden, yeah. And um, yeah, I remember that. So that's why I went back to Sydney to make the record. And yeah, I remember, uh, yeah, mm. yeah. So and then he got okay. sick, he got. 
uh, Bell's palsy, then he got bowel cancer, and he mm. sort of retired. And he's 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 fine now. He's okay. But um, that sort of was the end of my record career because <laughs> mm. you know he retired, and and I didn't have anybody sort of actively pushing the record or trying to get uh, it released. And to you it. need that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, May I, 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 I did a similar thing around 97, 96, 97, where um, some guys, Mick Flanders and that, had signed up a, a label. I started a label here called Arctic, and they they, and they were working with John in some way, I'm yeah. sure, around the thing. But they, they got signed as they became a sub label for BMG. Then, and we had a great album out, but Dave Wilson, who was the, um, the, um, the music director at, um, Triple M at the time thought my made a comment that my album was the most Triple M album of the year. But then Arctic went broke, <laughs> and so as an artist, you go yeah. with where the ship leans. You know, it's like um, yeah. uh, you, you you think you're on your career path, but then you, if you haven't got the label working with you, the publicist and the management, all these things working around you, the ship just tilts one way or another, and you never yeah, actually have the say on I that think course. That's, you know? that's what happened. I mean, I I got signed off this stuff I did in Brisbane which was sort of psychedelic rock and it was went under the name of lemon juice and, and really psychedelic. I love that. I love that yeah. album. I love yeah. that album. So we actually released it. it through, through ocean records, uh-huh. which was the, the mob that Darren Clark and um, Murray Lyons, Gary Smith, Bill Blake, right. David Richards and Robert Clark put together out of sweet 16. And we there released this record through them to Japan which which I recorded in my house at Kenmore with my mate Steve Glover, and then we sort of sent it down to Sydney to to try and shop the labels, and then every label wanted to sign it, which is great. So I went down to Sydney, and they're all all the labels offered us deals, but I said, well, we should talk to John Woodruff because he's just had Savage Garden. They sold eight bazillion records, so. Hmm. But he said, no, I'm busy. I've got no time to listen to anything. And then a friend of ours, um, Paul. Um, Oh, what's his name? Bass player from Mondo Rock, Paul Christie. Um, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll get on to John. He's a mate of mine. And he rang up John and said, you've got to listen to this stuff. And um, uh, he listened to it and then straight away rang up and said, great, I want to see Glenn. And I was down in Sydney and I said, oh, my manager at the time said, oh, he's in Sydney. And he said, no, no, tell him to go back to Brisbane. I'll be up tomorrow. And I was like, I guess he wanted to see how bad I wanted it. So I jumped in the car and drove back to Brisbane. And he was up mm-hmm. there the next morning at... at, at uh, David Richards place, one of my managers and um, at Grange. And then he just turned up and we had a 10 minute meeting. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make some, make records and write songs. He said, okay, done. That was it. He didn't want to see me play. He just said, I love these songs. Mm-hmm. We did a, a deal. I made a record with Charles Fisher producing, but we didn't record uh-huh. that lemon juice stuff. That was the, the first thing. That lemon we juice was awesome. That was an awesome album. I know. That was awesome. I absolutely so, love that album. And what happened was Charles said, well, this is already produced. What do you want me to do? And I said, well, let's just re-record it and you make it sound great. And he said, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I, it, I, he told John that and John said, I'll just do what Charles said. And I should have said, well, no, let's do what we originally were going to do. But anyway, I didn't. We made, ended up making this singer-songwriter record, which is a good record, but when Roadshow heard it, who we licensed the record to, they sort of went, this is not what we signed. And so they just, they weren't into it and they released two singles and then they dropped me and then John got sick and then he was going to get another mm-hmm. deal and then it never happened and then there you go. So we've spent so put, put, thousand dollars making this record mm-hmm. that never got released. Putting, and put, kids, putting kids, that into, hang, 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 tough, just putting that into perspective for people listening, Charles yeah. Fisher produced um, Savage Garden yep. and he made them... Lots of- Lots what of they people's did. debut albums, and he's had a lot of success with first albums for people. So, in so, Glenn, uh, Glenn's position, yeah. um, you would think you've got all the ducks lined up, yeah, and but this needs some of these I things to shift this. one way or another. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, I saw yeah. the story when, when we we're in Los Angeles. I saw that story numerous times where we're working in Cherokee Studios, which is a major studio complex in LA. And a few of the bands that came through, they were just absolutely amazing. To me, they were like steely dance of the 90s. They were amazing. Yeah. But because one thing or another went wrong with the label, this these albums, which they'd put, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars into and uh, produced by people who produced Boss Gags and all these other stuff, because then it went to the East Coast and the person in the label high up didn't lot wasn't had some personal issue going on, they would drop the act. And so yeah. many artists just it, 
every bit as talented as like the really big stars, the things have fallen over just because the business or some personal thing in the label or whatever else just didn't fall the right way. And I think it's a common yeah. story that I've, I've had the same thing with my, I won't go into my story because we're here to talk about you, but I've had the same thing happen a couple of times in my life where if things had just gone slightly the other way, it would be a different story how the careers ended up. But yeah. here we are, we're still playing music and we love it. So <laughs> I'm not going to be negative about all that, but mate, please keep, Tuffy, I sorry, sorry to interrupt you, mate. You were going to say something before. No, no, no. I'll, I'll do this for both of you. Um, is lemon juice still available on, uh, like, on through Spotify or anything like that? Because or... <laughs> <laughs> so, people are going. People Hold that up going, again. People are going to hear it. it. People are going to it hear is. it. Oh, so that's that's the album. It's, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple. It's on all the streaming things. I, I re-recorded it. Um, that's not the first version we did. The first version was up in Brisbane, but basically, that's what I heard. Yeah, but yeah, basically, most of those songs are on this, and I just re-recorded it, so I owned it, and um, yeah. you know, released it. And we had we actually had to put a band together a few and did a few gigs, but um, you know, it's just it's just so expensive to pay players and and you know play in rooms where you're not covering your costs. And there was a great band, yeah. but it was just, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's still available. But um, so, it's so, for the, so for the listeners and the viewers out there, where, how, what do they look for if they go to Spotify to get that? Just, just I let put, I, put, I, I put the banner up there for Glenn's um, website. Yeah. Is that right, Glenn? Yep. And, and you can also get that record from my band camp site, which is, I mean, you've got a band camp site, Nick, too, haven't you? Yeah. So, um, God, yeah, God bless and, and you look up, look up Lemon Juice or look up the title of the album, which is The, um, the Sound of Strawberry. So, Sound yeah. of Strawberry, that's Lemon Juice. And yeah. what about, what about, and, and you've got uh, The Gordons? What about the that? Gordons. Well, that's, that's, that's sort of Oliver Jones's thing. Oliver rang me. So, Oliver Jones, folks, if you don't know Oliver Jones, he's, um, he's in Vietnam or something now, isn't he? Hey? He's still yeah, overseas. He's in, is in Thailand or something. Thailand, he's playing gigs. Right. I think he, he got married. He's got a couple of kids. But um, Oliver was in Brisbane and worked with a guy called Hayden Bell, and they had a little jingle studio called Excalibur Productions. And I yeah. used to sing jingles around Brisbane for TV and radio and stuff. And I met Oliver and Hayden doing jingles. And Oliver's brother is Daniel Jones from Savage Garden. So that was sort of That's right, yeah. with John Woodruff, sort of. And so Oliver rang me one day and said, I'm putting this band together. It's a bit of a comedy thing. I just want to do this band doing big, dumb rock songs or pop songs. And it's called The Gordons because he thought Gordon was a funny name. And That's um, my middle name. <laughs> oh, I said, well, you better talk to Tuffy, mate. Um, <laughs> so uh, he just thought it was great. Everybody in the band's like, he had names like Johnny, Johnny Gordon, Hester Gordon, um, I can't remember the other names, but <laughs> anyway, he had all these songs like uh, I Want to Be an Accountant, uh, Mr. What is it? Mr. Universe. Um, what about the one about the roadies? All you can see is their crack or something like that. I remember something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, I Want to Be a Roadie. Anyway, it was sort of dumb rock and roll sort of stuff. But some yeah, of the but songs they're really well crafted. Yeah, yeah, really well crafted. Great. Yeah, there's some great yeah. songs on there. And we actually won a Sunny Award for one of those songs called Brand New Girl, which is about a blow-up doll <laughs> <laughs> that, that Oliver wrote. And um, I think actually Oliver and I both wrote it and we just recorded it and he must have submitted it for the Sunny Awards and actually won Best Pop Song one year. So it's pretty sounds, sounds to me like it might sounds to me like it might have been an inspiration for Regurgitator's song. But, um, <laughs> but mate, another part of that, uh, the, the office guy working in the studio was a guy called Greg Colson, who I interviewed yep. a couple of nights ago, who uh, Greg, yeah. Hot Wheels Harry, uh, Harry Hot Wheels, I mean, who, uh, uh, yeah, had a bad well, spine yeah, injury Greg. playing rugby league, and Greg's a great guy, you know. Yeah, I met Greg through Oliver and Hayden because he was running their office. Yeah. at um, great mates with Ollie. Yeah. Out at their studio at, um, where was it, Tanamera. Right. So, um yeah, I know. Greg. We got to. And, uh, I got to support my band, and I got to support Savage Garden um, at the Suncorp Piazza. So before they were doing stadiums or big really? gigs, we we got one that they just had their songs were just hitting, and yep. um, Darren and Daniel were were there. And uh, remember, my son Harry had just been born, and um, the guys were sort of meeting the kids and all that stuff. And uh, it was just a great vibe, though. They they 
yeah, it was, it was one of those things like in, in Brisbane at that time, it was like the Beatles had returned and they were doing so well. But the energy, the energy for the industry yeah. when local acts like that, and the boys were working in a local record shop basically, you know, and they kind yeah. of were doing their music and everything else. When a local act like that breaks on the scene and does well, it just invigorates the whole local industry. Yeah. And I mean, people don't realise, some people don't realise how well they did. I mean, they sold 30 million yeah, records. Brilliant. Yeah. You know, yeah. 15, yeah. 15 million of each album and they yeah. were massive. And, and, yeah. Yeah. and, yeah. and, and Daniel, this song... and, and... sorry? Go on. I just Go say, on. and Daniel, no, I really appreciate the fact that Daniel had the guts to pull the pin when he felt he had enough with the whole thing well, for whatever reason. It's like you take an act to a certain point, they kind of finished at the top where they were. They didn't yeah. just like endure out doing tour after tour into their heyday. They they finished where they were. Yeah. And that was, I think that's, I don't know the background story, but I think there's a lot of his call. But I really admire the fact that, that they took it to there. He, he wanted to move away. You know, yeah. Darren went on doing all the stuff he wanted to do beyond that. But um, yeah, they that, that were just a, a great, great pop duo. I, different time, different era, but to me, they reminded me of Air Supply insofar yeah. as the fact that they came out with these great songs that hit a really great market that wasn't really expected to come from Australia, but they did yeah. it, you know. And they got a lot of stuff on movies and television shows and yeah. stuff. You can hear them all the time. You hear them all the time. Yeah, yeah just yeah, they did they're well. good songs. They're great good songs. songs. Yeah, man. Great songs. Yeah, so that makes, uh, yeah. makes a big and difference. Glenn, yeah. Glenn, Glenn, how much, from your experience, how much did Charles Fisher play in taking them from good songs to what they had worldwide? Um, well, if you talk to Charles, he'll tell you it was all him. So, yeah, but from, <laughs> someone, from someone who worked you know, inside. Charles, is, Charles yeah. is good because, I mean, he they call him the song doctor and he is in a way because he would he was make these great suggestions even to me when I was doing my record. And he's going, <laughs> you know what? You should You should put a... A bit there and you should repeat that and you go oh okay okay and and everything that i tried that he suggested was a great idea so i think charles did a lot for sure i mean they started recording in charles's lounge room in his house in mm. rose bay where i started doing my record and he just had a 24 track machine in his front room and they just put it together and um you know i think um he had a lot to do with you know, so from your experience, it. is it fair to say he didn't take over the songs, but he directed the songs the right way as a producer? I think so, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what the demos were like. I've no. heard some of the demos through Oliver years ago, but, um, you know, I think, I mean, obviously those guys are really talented and wrote great songs and, um, and had a, a, a sort of an idea of what they wanted to do. But I think definitely Charles would have um, helped to shape that, the sound of that whole thing. You know. well, that's an interesting point, mate. I think one of the things all three of us have experienced is um, we've had the pleasure, while, while, while we've tried to push our own music and develop that, we've also had the pleasure of playing these great songs night after night. And we've tried to take these songs and do them in our own way, our own versions of these cover songs. Um, but, but that's the thing. It's like if you can strip a song back to a voice and a guitar or a voice and a piano to its very basics and it works, to me that's a sign of a great song. And I think yeah. uh, what a producer does beyond that can add to it all, of course. But if you haven't got that basis of a great song at the beginning, um, you've got nothing. And I yeah. think we've had the pleasure in what we do with our careers to actually take songs back to that basic element and then try and take the heart and soul of it and share that with a really intimate audience in our, in our solo gigs. Yeah, well, you... I'm yeah, like, sure like Sweet because... Caroline and <laughs> Live Next Door to Alice. <laughs> You know. <laughs> the gambler, come on, mate. <laughs> no, I, I, I love, I love getting up there. And, I love getting up there if I have to play those party songs to get the vibe I'll do it. But then you bring into the heart of that other songs that, you know, whether it's for, for me personally, James Taylor or Cat Stevens' song or a, a Cranberry song or something that's left to centre and the, yeah. you just capture people's attention. And you try and take them on that journey. And then now that journey, you bring in some of your music and you just build that bridge of communication between people by using songs. And I've always had this thing, like my goal is always to be, in, you know, I've had seven albums out of my own. I've always tried to push my own music, but I've had to make most of my living by playing cover gigs. That's the fact of it. But I think I've done those cover gigs in a way where I've, I've justified those songs by doing my own versions in a pretty unique way. 
and respecting yeah. those songs. And, man, that's what Elvis, uh, the Beatles, so many acts did. They take these songs that they haven't written often and, and well, take the Beatles out in their early days. I'm talking about that. But so many artists use other people's songs well, and, and communicate with people. Stones? Yeah, yeah. maybe everyone's done it. And, and I, I always get annoyed when people criticise artists who are doing the, you know, the cover gigs. But, man, if, if that saved me ever having to work in a shoe shop or whatever else, you know, was, I always made my living out of playing music, learning my craft, and then trying to spin that off into what I've done. And I think all three of us have shared that same experience. Yeah. Never had to go on the doll. No. Never had to go on the doll. Oh, no. co- co- COVID, was, yeah. COVID was the closest to that bullshit. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. interesting. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah all, all of a sudden, no work. mate. And and when, when you because you're forced to, yeah, that's. Uh, I hope you know I won't go down that rabbit hole tonight because we, I don't, I think we'd like to keep things positive, but you know, so many. I I kind of became a bit of a big mouse in my in my little echo chamber during that time, and a lot of that was because I saw so many of my friends in the industry were just struggling to keep their heads above water and survive and keep their mind together. And I thought if I just throwed comments out there, hopefully someone would come back and I could call them tomorrow and say, hey, you okay? And we had to do a lot of that during that time. Um, but besides all of that, you know, I think the fact that we've all made our living by playing music is something yeah. to, to be proud of. I, during that COVID time, as a sensible, mature person, I should have found something else to do. But after doing what I've done, and that's just life before me, but writing music and working with music and waking up every day thinking about music, I couldn't figure out what else to do. And that was a failure of mine in, during that time. But at the same time, I'm I, I'm happy that I've woken up dreaming about music every day instead of having to turn up and do a job for somebody else that I would hate hated being there. Yeah. Absolutely. How old are you now, Glenn? Sorry? How old are you now? 62. 62. 68. 60? Yeah, man. 61, Nelly. Yeah. Yeah, come on now. Not yeah, Jesus. Bad for a month, <laughs> 38. <laughs> yeah, no, like it, it's kept us young, you know, it kept us young at heart, too. You know, like I reckon that. it does, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm still I'm still 32. That was the age I got to Brisbane. And I'm yeah. still in that mode, you know. I, my whole yeah. mindset hasn't changed one little bit. Yeah. I, I got locked at 38, got that's right. I wake up feeling 38. But, but I think the thing is, I, I had this pleasure of spending a couple of weeks in, in Beijing with uh, Andy Summers from the police. And this is going back to 2012. Yeah. And and uh, Andy, we organised for him to be the, um, the, the he was doing a lot of photography. When he came with. The, feature of the feature of the Beijing Arts Festival, I organised for that to happen. But, but when we picked him up, we, we first lunch we had together, I had some Chinese friends with me and he made the mistake of saying he loved lamb. So every place we went, he got in just like overrun by having lamb dishes. I think he got out of that. <laughs> but at that lunch, he said he was 73. He was 10 years older than Sting and Stuart Copeland. And he looked like he was about 50. Um, yeah. Maybe even left. But as I spent those couple of weeks with him, I realised the reason he looked like he was 50 because he kind of refused to grow up. I mean, he was yeah, a exactly. young, successful person, but he was like chasing these dreams. He even went to the doctor at one stage, he, he got bitten by something in Thailand and we had to take him to the doctor and all that. And with this lovely Chinese female doctor. And in a very cool kind of way, he was like just tuning this doctor so brilliantly. He was like being a lad at 73 that made him look like at that time about 30. But it was just this mental thing where he, he hadn't grown up. And I, I, I heard an interview with him just last week or so, a couple of weeks ago with Rick Beto. And he's still... Oh, yeah, still that. Like, He's yeah. in his eighties now, and he still seems yeah. like he's like fifty something. Yeah. And and I think there's a lot to be said for maintaining a pathway towards a dream. I've had friends who've had their yeah. careers, they've got done their thing, and they decide to retire, and they seem to get really old. There's something to be yeah. said if you still got to wake up tomorrow and figure out how you're going to survive, how you're going to chase your dream, how you're going to do that. It just puts this metal thing in your in in your personality or your 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 genes. I think that says, I I can't grow old yet. I've got to keep chasing what I'm doing. I think music does that. Yeah. Inspires that within people. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm still learning songs every week. I'm still getting out there and, and just doodling. Pick up the guitar, make it up. Shit, you know. Just for a bit of just for the fun. You can't help it. Yeah. Oh, you do a gig. You do a gig, and and suddenly you find out you put you're putting your voice in a different position. 
or you're finding this new yeah. way to expand your vocal or then how you use that song in a different way to connect to an audience that you haven't connected with before. There's just these no, well, mysteries that's what I've been doing. That's, I saw an interview with Rick Beno with Mark McDonald. And yeah, I, I saw it too. <laughs> how good was it? Yeah. And I was yeah. up there going, she came from somewhere. Da, 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 da. She will be free. She But how but mate, how hum how humble was Michael McDonald about just being a member of the bands he's been in and walking into these situations and falling into things. I mean, he's probably one of the greatest vocalists of our generation. And yeah. he's, he's, uh, 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 he's brilliant. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Have you I, seen love the that, I love that bit about, yeah, oh, no. The There's a doco on the doobies, yeah, which is quite good. Uh, so, really? anyway. yeah. Yeah. I love the bit we he's talking about when they do it minute by minute. Yeah, uh, and he thought he destroyed that. the yeah, boobie, yeah. doobies. Yeah, he goes... <laughs> He's walking around, I'm walking around with Mr. just the bloody, uh, uh, yeah, half naked eating cold pizza, thinking I've destroyed the band. And so it's up, <laughs> it's got a number one. <laughs> because sometimes well, it's shit house. But before that, <laughs> one he's saying that. Time it was <laughs> but he's saying before that they they finished the tour in Japan and they decided to split yeah. up. And he, him and That's him it. and I think it's Pat Simmons or something went to Hawaii, and they they. They were just smoking dope there and they got the call from the label and their management saying, what are you guys doing? This album's just gone to number one. And they thought it was a huge failure. You know, it's, there's nothing you can predict about it. You get someone like Michael McDonald. And that was one of the great things when I was working in Cherokee Studios. I mean, we would be working there and uh, Ice-T was doing an interview in the lounge room with MTV or Gene Simmons was producing Lita Ford in the studio next door to us or um, Rick... Um, What's his name? Um, crazy, crazy Rick. Um, oh, I've forgotten his name there. Um, he got charged actually on some sexual charge thing with his wife. Um, um, super freak, super freak. What's his name? Rick James. Rick James. Oh, Rick he, James kept, yeah. he, kept, he was recording one of the studios and kept coming in and pitching our beers out of our fridge and all that stuff. But when you're in that environment or you hear Michael McDonald talking to Rick Bado, it's just people who play music hanging out together. They're not stars. There's not these things. There's oh, not no. these differences. It's just people All being people around people. music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a great level, yeah. and uh, and I think we've all known people who've become very successful at different levels across the industry. Oh. Um, we we also know that we could have been there if things had gone the other way. But the the fact is, we've had the joy of being being able to play music all our lives, and I think that's pretty special, you know. Oh, and mate, we're still alive, and we're still breathing, and we're still That's enjoying right. life. They've enjoyed life more than I have right now. You know, it's just, we've got grandkids yeah. and all that type of stuff. But you know, I just, I just wake up every morning thinking, "Geez, how good is this?" Yeah. And then, uh, then I have a fall, and then I get up and I go, "Okay, yeah, it was okay." It was right. <laughs> How's the renovations on the RV going, mate? Ah, oh, okay, no, it's like we're supposed to be finished next by next Tuesday, but I reckon it's gonna, I reckon it's gonna, yeah, you know, I went up there the other day, nothing's been done, and they've had it for nearly a week, and so I don't know, we're, we're gonna get out of here. We, we think we'll go book up Malulaba for another couple of weeks, and get out of here next Tuesday, uh, and then we'll see how it goes from there. But, oh, mate, I, mate, that's, that's what I am these days, you know, I sort of don't give a fuck. <laughs> but mate, yeah, but mate, you you travel around, you travel around a bit and do a lot of corporate functions too, mate. That that I put the banner up there, tuffyworld.com.au. If people want to book you for a, a private gig or a corporate gig that you love to do, that's the address to get you at, right? Yeah, that's it. Tuffy, tuffy, tuffyworld.com.au. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then Lynn takes after after takes after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, uh, you bring the you, you bring the brains into the organisation. They do and she deals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, she takes it over and, and everything works smoothly. <laughs> uh, so, so, Glenn, what's next for you down Sydney way, mate? What's, what's your plans? Well, um, this week, next week, they're both big weeks. I've got five gigs this week and five next week. And wow. it's, yeah, yeah, that's I do, good. I do a lot of Irish pubs as well. And because it's yep. uh, St. Patrick's next weekend, I've got a gig on Saturday doing some Irish stuff. I mean... I know a bunch of it, but I don't know heaps. But anyway, we'll do a few and then we'll stop and we'll do the other stuff. <laughs> so yeah. um, pretty busy just doing covers gigs. Um, 
trying to write some new stuff. I started doing some stuff last year, but um, and I've sort of recorded another record and it's nearly finished. I've just got to mix it and pull some things out. But I sort of got stuck, so I stopped doing it about October. Um, and then um, just writing and recording, wondering what I'm going to do when I grow up. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you got a studio at home? Sorry? You got a studio at home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting in it now. I've just, you know, just a few bits of outboard gear and just using Logic and got a bunch of guitars and some stuff. And um, if I need real drums, my brother can play and record tracks and stuff. Or um, I do a lot of production for people, mixing things. And um, I do, I, I, I spend a lot of time doing music workshops around the country with. Adam Thompson from Chocolate Starfish. You know the singer? Yeah, yeah. And he's got a company called Muso Magic, and we spent 17 years doing workshops around Australia, a lot of stuff in India, um, and a lot of corporate stuff as well. But we started off in Queensland, actually. We, we used to have a contract with Education Queensland. And what it was, it was like a two-day program. We'd go to high schools, um, and we'd write songs with the kids, and show them how to write songs. They we we teach them, so they did it. They'd record it. I did the audio production. Adam would facilitate the workshop, and then we do a recording and a video, and then we do a live performance at the end. And we did that for seventeen years. That's <laughs> um, cool. And 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 um, it was more a team building thing. It wasn't to make people musicians, or it was just to bring people together through the you know the the love of music yeah. and and. Um, and, and, and it was based, it was aimed at at-risk kids, which means kids that are at risk of leaving school before, you know, uh, leaving school age because of stuff at home or other other things. And um, a lot of those kids were, you know, they turn up the first day and sort of sit there and go, well, I'm not doing this, I don't want to do anything. And, and they didn't have to, but most of them at the end of the two days would come up and say, that was the best two days of my life, you know. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah. that was a great thing. I did another one of those just before Christmas last year. We went up to Catherine and out in the communities. We did a lot of Aboriginal communities uh, all around the country as well. So tons of um, community work, um, which was great. So we did that. Um, so was that, that a, in, is that a government funded funded thing, or is it, it initially? How's it work? Initially, when we started, it was through Education Queensland. Adam had some contacts, yeah. and we used to work in high schools in Queensland. And then yeah. we started working with a mob in Melbourne called Red Dust Role Models, who would basically take athletes, famous footy players, basketball players, to the communities, because the kids love basketball and AFL. Mm -hmm. And that was popular. But once they brought our music thing in, that, that became the most popular thing of the lot. So we ended up doing millions yeah. of... Oh, lots of communities, not millions, but lots of communities over the last uh, 17 years and um, met some amazing people, went to some amazing places. And, um, yeah, so I think now it's just um, he's got sort of contacts in different states and, and he does a lot of corporate things as well. But, yeah, we just went out to the communities just in October for two weeks. That was great. Mm. Um yeah, I think it's a real growth area in that sense. Um, you got yeah. a guy Josh Arnold up here in um in around Toowoomba Way. I worked with my mate Jason Millhouse and his uh, studio down at Cooparoo. They often go out working with the um the regional schools and uh, yep. indigenous community schools. And you got Dan Neeb at um Dan Neeb at Redcliffe, who's um put together a whole project that works with um uh, disabled and autistic um yep. people around music and. Yeah, that's one of the things I think that we is a growth area for the industry is how music connects to people. I mean, it's music to me, you know, going off a tangent here, it's like the voice of God insofar as I think we live in a, a, an energy vibrational universe. And there's a reason that newborn infants connect to music and also people in their um, dementia stages in the old age connect to music there's something that goes beyond our physical that connects to music and, and what's yeah. what's beyond everything else and i think that's an area that um you don't have to be a star in the traditional sense of the of the um of the industry to yeah. shine with your music i think there's a way music can be used in many ways and i wish yeah. that's something once again that yeah you know, i've i'm have this big push 
or this big, I'd be a loud mouth quite often about talking about how governments don't look at our industry as a, they look at something that needs to be propped up all the time through funding and through grants and everything else. Whereas we sh I think our industry should be looked at something that can be a driver of domestic economic spending, uh, domestic spending, and can also be a driver as, of, as an export product. We need to be looked at almost like the mining industry where, where we can add value to the economy, we don't need to be propped up. And one of those areas we can really add value to the economy, you know, I think is in that dysfunctional youth area and mental health areas and how music can help in the health sectors. You know, I think that's an area that uh, we, we need to be given some serious attention to. Yeah, no, it's, um, it, it was a great thing doing that for me. It was just, mm. it was really re rewarding in a, in a mm. you know, we did it for a long time and it's still going on, there's still workshops. And um, I mean, we wrote over the 17 years, like, you know, 1500 songs. And we worked with the Australian Shipping yeah. Team. We worked with big corporate groups. We worked in, in Singapore, in Thailand. In, in, we did heaps of stuff in India. We did stuff through um, Brett Lee's foundation in Mumbai and also Steve Waugh's foundation in Kolkata. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's just another way you can use music to connect with people and, and, and do cool stuff. And, you know, so over the last probably 20 years after my record deal, fell on a heap I've, I've just been doing live gigs covers gigs um some original gigs when i can do them but you know um and also workshops and um a bit of a lot of production at home as well and um still a bit of graphic design my yeah. wife's a photographer she does music videos and bits and pieces and um so yeah it's all sort of music based but uh you know you you, you sort of veer off and do little different things which sort of keeps you well, interested as well i think it's like any other small business where at the end of the day we're sole traders or we run a small business yeah. and every small business has to have three or four or five different streams of income coming in yeah. and um yeah obviously through COVID, the problem was we had our main form of income ripped out from under our feet but um that's one of the things we have to develop moving forward is yeah the models changed you know growing up in the 80s 90s i was able to do my gigs i was able to um, sell merchandise so I could sell CDs and selling CDs and then getting, you know, uh, publishing returns from APRA were, yeah. were a very significant part of my income. With streaming, I got a thing through the other day for my I don't know, quarterly or six monthly, whatever thing from APRA, and I had a dollar 49 was my income from streaming. Um, yeah. Whereas back in the day, I could probably sell over that time a thousand CDs at 20 bucks a head and get 20 grand to supplement my income. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts on where we are now and what changes are going to happen or for a new generation coming through, mate, where, where do you idea. see from, we're at? From oh. I can, sorry, go on. Yeah, I'm just going, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, from what I can people. see, I don't, I don't know, but, um, people I've spoken to, uh, there's a lot more opportunity. Well, a lot more people are trying to get what they call sync opportunities, getting your music and TV and films and stuff and on the streaming platforms like Netflix and Stan and all that other thing. Get your, get your song so, to Glenn, the show. Why you, sorry, sorry, mate, while you've pointed that out, I just want to just point, throw in a thing here. One of my arguments up here has been that the Queensland government has done a very good job at putting incentives in place for films to be produced and right. created at, at, at the Gold Coast. What's happened there? Why can't they go a step further then and actually add a few added incentives if the, those film productions use two, three, five percent of Queensland music co content in their in their projects? So I think yeah. that's one area of expansion. And sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to, no, that was no, a perfect right. platform for me to that's say. Good idea. I think that's a, that's an area of growth for us, you know. Yep. No, that's 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 a great idea. I mean, you know, you've got to you've got to give every opportunity to you know local artists in 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 the area where you're talking about to, to get, you know, to get in there because. And, and from, the from that put together, from that put together an education thing, which shows artists how they can work in with those type of projects. I mean, yeah. my early days in the nineties in Los Angeles, I, I was fortunate to, to my, my first producer of my sing, first singles was a guy called Adam Smalley. And Adam is a music editor who's done a lot of Spielberg movies, but his dad was a guy called Jack Smalley, who was an orchestrator for, 
uh, Last of the Mohicans and various other TV shows in America. Yeah. And they just knew how to work in with the film industry because they grew up in Los Angeles. That's maybe something we need to be teaching here is like instead of um, you know, pouring money into a grant that goes nowhere or just goes into a, a project that goes overseas, how do we put yeah. that into something that shows local industry, local musicians how they can be more proactive in working with the film industry and you don't have to be an orchestrator you don't have to know all the ins and outs but your skills of writing songs can flow into that film industry i believe yeah i think it's it's a good idea i mean I've, I, you see a lot of stuff on netflix or whatever series and there's some really interesting music in all these shows you know mm -hmm. that you've never heard of before but it's it's good because you've never heard it so yep. you know and i always try and find out who it is and use the old What's that Shazam app to see who, who Shazam. Is and stuff. Shazam, mate. And um but yeah, that's a great idea. And and you know, if you can like you said, if you can give those people incentives to use local content, um, instead of buying in the you know, I wanna I wanna stick this big famous song in and I mean once again, you know, it's it's their art, so you can let them do what they want to do. But if if you can mm. promote using local artists or, you know, but Matt, I watched a, I watched a movie. I've watched it twice the last couple of days. Actually, a movie called Dog, which is about this army dog in America. But the top and tail end of the music, and there's great music in the whole movie. But Chris Stapleton does the top and tail yeah. end songs, and I I love Chris Stapleton stuff. Yeah. But mate, the songs he had in there were nothing that Nick or or Glenn or Tuffy couldn't be writing if it was a production out here, or other musicians yeah. I know couldn't be yeah, writing. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, and we've got we're good at what we do. So we would just yeah. love some support in getting into those areas, I believe. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, well, I heard, well, sorry, mate. Uh, okay. Come on. Yeah, no, yeah, go, Tuff. Go. No, you go, Tuff. No, uh, yeah, yeah, no. I was watching... I've been, been watching uh, Blacklist. Yep. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. Wolf Butler comes on. in one part of that. Mm. Oh, there you go. Like a little brizzy act in there, buddy. What's yeah. the money like in that stuff? What they, how's that work? Does that just get a one-off payment for it? Or they get a... I, I think it's, it's, they, it's changed, but Glenn can explain that best. Thing. Yeah. I think it's funny because I'm actually talking to a guy in, in Los Angeles at the moment who's recorded a couple of uh, songs that I wrote with my friend Kerry Buchanan. And um, we had a band. You remember Kerry Buchanan, Tuffy, drummer? Yeah. Yeah, drummer? yeah, 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 yeah. For many years. So yeah, he play with, I met him he up there. With, yeah, sorry? Was he with uh, Dragon? Was he he has played no. with Dragon, yeah. And he's played. he played with Marsha yeah. Hines for years. He played with Tina Arena. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Margaret Ehrlich. Um, anyway, I met him in Brisbane and then he moved to Sydney and I moved back to Sydney and then we caught up again and we started a band called Kerosene and we did this album and um, which looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I've sold on my album, so I've got nothing left. I've, I've actually run out of my, my CDs. And I took, I took that picture on the cover actually out in the, near the community. So, <laughs> so All right. Anyway. Cool. So, yeah, so we um we wrote an album that in about two thousand and eight, I think it was, and we did this record, and and it's a great record. But once again, we did four or five gigs, and we couldn't afford to keep paying the players. And anyway, yeah. there's a guy that that I met um in L I didn't meet him in L A years years ago. John Woodruff put me together with this girl called Michelle Smith from Melbourne, and. She, this guy is her husband, Eddie, and um, I wrote with her years ago. Nothing happened with the songs, but she moved to LA. They got married. They got kids. She texted me out of the blue and said, can we use this song we wrote? Because my husband, Eddie, wants to record it, blah, blah, blah. I said, sure. And so he's ended up recording two of our songs, Kerry and myself, our songs off the Kerosene record. And he's just released his first single, which is a bit of a reggae sort of Jack Johnson sort of vibe called um his name is eddie wits w-i-t-z his name's eddie horowitz but he calls himself eddie wits um and it's, it's a bit of a jack johnson that sort of ben harper sort of vibe this song's called my island and it's out at the moment i think it's getting a bit of streaming and stuff but he's recorded these two other songs of ours and he's putting another an ep out and he's talking to us saying he's got a lot of supposedly sync opportunities because he lives in LA. He's got a, a marketing company. I think he's quite successful. And um, so he, he's got a lot of contacts. So we're just hoping that he can maybe do something with these songs and get them into some of these shows. But we're just in the 
the moment uh, negotiating with him about the the splits with the publishing and all that sort of stuff. So I, I just had I so just had a cool so, idea. Yeah, Glenn, did you do you know um, Mike Flanders? I know the name. Mike Flanders. Well, mix 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 produced a lot of my albums, and um, he's been over in Nashville for quite a while now. Right, and um, he ran a, ran a publishing com- company over there, and he's got his head around how publishing works over there. I reckon it'd be cool if we set up a four way trap bet- chat between us three and Mick to talk yep. about what's happening in Nashville, even down to one of the things I, one of the things that, you know, here in Australia, we have nothing set up where musicians get super or we get, you know, our kind of, we have no plan. We get our money and randomly and all this stuff. The studio system in, in America is very cool where they get paid through a central organization that looks after all those extra things. And I'd love to see that happen for our young musicians coming through here, but talking about that and how that then networks into publishing groups and in America, music lawyers and attorneys play a big part between the artists, the publishers, the record labels and everything else. So that could be a good chat between the four of us. So I just want to throw that out there if you're interested. We should get Mick online and have a chat about what's happening in Nashville in the States and what ideas we could bring into Australia. Yeah. Back to you, mate. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no. Um, And what you asked originally, Tuffy, was what, what sort of money or how do they pay for that? From what I understand from Eddie, there's usually yeah. just like a, a buyout fee. So if they say, hey, we love this song, we want to use it in our new Netflix series, obviously depending on what their budget is or what they can get it for from you, um, there's usually a fee that they'll say, look, we'll give you, I don't know, depending who the artist is, but if it's, you know, we'll give you five grand, we'll give you 10 grand, we'll give you 20 grand. And, and that allows them to use that for the use of their series and i think on top of that you'd get um some sort of publishing royalties as well as the yep. buyout fee but the buyout fee is for whoever owns the recording so that's what we're trying to yep. do at the moment is negotiate because it's all very well saying hey i can get your song in a in a netflix show we'll get some great sync things but unless you've got a contract with that guy saying well if you get a buyout figure of 20 grand we want a third each you know I mean, you've still got to get paid for it yeah. because he would own the recording because he's done a new recording of this song of ours. But And if, it's great you're getting into the show, but if we haven't got a thing in place with him saying <laughs> we want a part of whatever you get, then we get nothing. You know what I mean? Just Glenn, it was really show. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was really it was really interesting. I, um, I, I had a 10-year journey in China where I... Yeah. Um, uh, without going into details, I accidentally ended up over there, but I, I had a song go number three on their national charts and became entwined and exposed to how their government and media landscape works. When I first went over there in 2006, six seven, everything about the industry was government subsidised. It was all like festivals, everything, and they were pretty lame because they were all just government money. And they had a position at that time that you, you couldn't sell a CD in China properly because... Um, there were all these copies being made. And the reason the copies were being made was the government looked at it that you got paid for your work at the recording stage. So if you record a song, you get paid for that, then that becomes public property and you that's, that's a commercial item beyond that, so you don't get anything else. When it came to 2011-12 and the new government coming in, one of the things they wanted to do was actually boost their economy and particularly the rural sector, which had been left behind and been kept in the poor and they wanted to raise them into the middle class. Now, to do that, they had to literally expand access to commercialization across the country. You couldn't do that by building things everywhere. So they spent a lot of money and energy in in investing and, and developing their internet access. So if you were living in the far reaches of China, you suddenly had access to be able to buy within one day's of delivery the same items you can buy in Beijing. And one of the drivers of that economy was the digital content market of which music played a major role. So you had all these artists who for so long had been paid through, but like they'd get sponsored by a, a mining company in China as a government sponsorship and they would get their wage through that mining company. They'd make recordings, they'd get paid through performances, but they were paid through that system. Suddenly a lot of these people were empowered to be their own record labels, to be their own, own their own content and to have value within their content. And it actually made a lot of independent artists very, very successful in, in China. And that's a little bit of the model I think we need to look at here. 
how do we empower? Yeah, you've got the government at the moment going into fight against Facebook and Meta about the news content. You know, they're saying, okay, Mark Zuckerberg said that you're not going to pay for news content. So the government's fighting to support those news services who they need to help them win the next election. So they support them. Where's the government fighting for creative artists in the music sector to get better rights through Spotify and all these other streaming services to make money from the content that we make? And I, the, why should they be doing that? Because I saw a successful model in China where that helped build digital the digital economy of content became one of the five pillars of the chinese economic uh, platform we could make our digital content of music and other digital content a major pillar of the australian economy if we put a focus on it and i think that's a shift we need to move to th through somehow we just need to centralize the power base of all the musicians all the people who work in the gig economy who work in restaurants, who work in all these things, all these people that got abused through the whole COVID thing, we find, need to find some way to centralise our power so that our power base can become a major force at elections. And if we can do that, we need to change the opinion on how our industry is looked at so that us creators can get a bit of better deal in making money by adding power and strength to the economy. So sorry, go. I go my little rants like this every now and then, mate. So you have to forgive <laughs> me good. for that. But it's it's like, um, yeah. I think us guys as we're elders in the industry, we need to have discussions around how we make it better for the next generation coming through, and how we fight for the things we love and the things that we lost. I mean, we all have been successful in certain degrees, but we should have been more successful. And you know, I think a lot of that comes down to a lack of structure we should be around our industry rich. model. We should be rich. Hey? We should be filthy but rich. Absolutely. We should we be living the life of Riley. Rich. We should be. Should, should be living the life yeah. of Riley driving yeah. around around in driving around in RVs to every luxury place in the country. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's not that bad. Hey, you think about it. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, but guys, what do you think? What, what do you think as, uh, as seen uh, as, as, as as guys have been around as guys have been around the industry? You know, what what could we be doing to make it better? Hmm. Oh, mate, if you get the pub scene going again, it's um, the pub scene is terrible. So you need yeah. to get basics people getting back into music. I mean, I went out Sunday to had a look around the valley, and they had on the. Uh, the, uh, the you know the kickbox and all the M A M E B B B buddy, B uh, you know you know the thing the thing. You're um, you're a seat. They just sitting around, they're sitting around like this. You're this yeah. just sitting around like this watching yeah. it. Uh, the bar is completely. It, there's no fun in the industry yeah. anymore. People are, and, and it's all the mobile phones, everything. The attention it used to be on the stage. There you got the buddy. I'm buying it. You buy it. I put it on. Yeah. Oh. And he's a magician. He's kind of getting it. People get excited. People are talking about is getting the finish number gigs. Has in backyard parties where they buy certain things. The, the cost to go. Say, say, nothing. Mate, mate, say that. Lenny, say that again. For, for mate, say that again. You, say that again. You froze for a while. Can you just go over that about the backyard parties? Can you? You froze. Oh, froze just repeat right. what oh. you said, mate. Okay then. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. What we're talking about was people have come to you gigs. I mean, Nick, you've got a really big following. Uh, in the you know the 40s plus market yep. from all of our particularly, but we did a gig at the Osborne for New Year's Eve, and it was one of the biggest gigs I've played at. You know, it was as far as it was going on. So it's a market there for people who want to experience that that sort of thing because you're just not getting in the pubs now. The, the pubs are so boring; they're just the most boring yeah. place you ever be. You know, that's why I hardly play it. You know? And um, yeah. yeah, when it, when, it, when we got that guy, and the people are, you know, excuse me for my language, 
all the people out there, but the greatest compliment I ever got at a gig was, you're okay. Oh, that seemed better. But every time I go to your gig, I fall through. <laughs> That was the greatest couple I've ever had. Nothing to do with my music or anything else. And that was the gig. That was my job. That's what I did. You know, like he, he had heaps of girls and and uh, and they went out with that purpose of turning up the gig. You know, they're going to have a good time. And if there's heaps of girls, it's going to be good. It's, I counted 32 blokes and three girls watching the MMA or whatever it's called. Mixed martial arts at MMA. Watching that, and not one person. I was talking to the duty manager, and for about twenty minutes, and never, not one person went up to the bar. You know, yeah. uh, so the, the fun has gone out of it. So uh, I'm, uh, what we want to do is take it back. Now you imagine me and Nick playing together or individually to your old crowd. Uh, all we're going to do is go and go to the bottle shop. I always say to pubs like, "Please, Steve." Or what? Uh, what's the difference? What, what's people going to get in here? What's your business today? Okay, okay, everyone's got service, so everyone's putting on the footing. Everyone's putting on the MMA. Everyone's, everyone's so You've got to be the unique place. I mean, I want to have a place where they're putting up the Three Stooges on the big screen and and just great music play, and that's that's sort of vibe. Well, uh, Nick knows the story of the, of the Normby. They had the when I first started to play. The, the Normby, you know, I don't know if you know what happened. The Normby. I've only got ten percent of actually two boys. Just let you know. Um, they used to have the, 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 uh, the footy playing on the screen. And I thought, um, I said, what, what, what's, you know, and everyone was up the back and you got a few blokes standing up the front looking at the game, you know, you get, you get a little fast. So we got two backpackers who were friends of my daughters who uh, were photographers and we ended up taking photos of all the girls in the place in real time and putting it back up, putting that on the big screen. And next thing, all the, it was all girls up the front and, and going off, and the, and the place took off. It ended up ended up being one of the biggest Sundays that's ever happened, you know. Yeah, it's little yeah. things like that. He put the personality back into the room, and that's what's missing. It's, and it's missing in everything, mate. It doesn't matter where you go, you know. Yeah. You know, everything's boring. It's all boring. You walk along the street, people just look at their iPhones, they're walking along, you know. Okay, what yeah. the hell happened? Where'd the fun go? I mean, I've been yeah. to anyway, pubs. That's my rant. I, yeah, I, I agree. I think the pubs are boring and they've got all the football and all the sports and all that bullshit, which, look, I'm not into that. I know a lot of people are, obviously. But you get to gigs and some a manager came up to me at this pub out near Penrith, I don't know, six months ago. And it was a Thursday night. And I'm playing up one end in the bistro area and right down the other end is the sports bar. It's a brand new pub mm-hmm. and it's ugly, horrible place. Anyway, the manager came up and said, oh, what time are you finishing? And I said, well, you're the manager, don't you know? It's, it's you know, nine o'clock. And he said, oh, oh, the football's on at eight. Yeah. And I said, I said, and? I said, well, do you want me to go? Well, he said, oh, I don't know. And this is the manager, right? And I said, well, mate, if you want me to pack up, I'll go. It's fine. Yeah. Whatever, you know? Oh, I don't know. And then he just wandered off and I just kept playing and then packed up at nine. Yeah. You know, things like that. You know, I played this pub at Bondi and it's 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 an Irish bar and it's it's sort of brand new and it's a sports bar basically. The screen huge screens are everywhere on f- three walls and they set you up in the corner and you turn over there and there's a big greyhound and turn over and you're just yeah. thinking yeah. fuck am I doing this shit for? <laughs> Mate, well, I, I just say to them. And then, they, and then they wonder why people don't come uh, to see music, you know? Well, I, I, as far as the actual playing time goes, I say to yeah. them, look, the important thing for your venue is people are here drinking, yeah. having a good time. Yeah. If that means they need to watch footy, I'll stand yeah. aside, let them watch the footy. I'm not going to yeah. play over that and annoy their footy watching. But you're still paying me the same because I could have been booked elsewhere. And I'm here for this time, so you pay me for yeah. my time, whether I'm playing or not. You know, that's it's not about whether I play; it's about whether we keep people happy drinking in the bar. Yeah. And if that's part of the whole thing, if I've got to play 15 minutes at the end, I'll pay that. But you still pay me for a full gig because I'm I here. Just remember, I could have been working yeah. elsewhere. And they don't know how to set it up. Like I remember Tuffy. Tuffy no. Yeah, but that hasn't. You but, said to me, Tuffy. You said, mate, when you but, walk but, in the venue, you've got to see the music straight away. You know. Yeah. And and. They stick you in a corner, yeah. they stick yeah. you behind a big screen, they stick you here, yeah. and then they go, yeah. oh, are you playing tonight? I didn't know. 
the manager says. Yeah. That. yeah, exactly. They have it every week, but he didn't know, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, or, the, know. or punters call, people who know you call up and say, what time does Nick start? And they're like, yeah. who's Nick? What's happening? They have no idea. <laughs> but, but man, that's the difference between back in yeah. those days, well, that, they, that had work, the they, had to, they had to work, they had to work, they had to work with us. Getting those words. Well, they had to work with us back in those days because that was about bringing people in the bar. Once it became about pokies and restaurants and everything else, the bars lost that whole thing. But we have to go back to finding a reason to put bums on seats. End of the day, we can't sit here bitching about how bad pubs are. We've got to find a reason to put bums on seats. And look, I'm, with my 70s show, I'm trying to come up with something that will put some bums on seats. Uh, what Tuffy and I are doing, we're trying to tap into that memory lane thing to bring well, people out, been... have a good time. This is the backyard thing, Nick. Yeah. 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 But Duffy's been talking. We've been working that's on right. how do we put together backyard that's gigs. Right. That's uh, one little story. Oh. You all right, mate? Go. Yeah. He, do you want me to talk, Nick? Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, I thought you are halfway through what you got to say. We've got a bit okay. of we've got a bit of yeah, a delay, yeah, yeah, which yeah. just well, cuts in on each other. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm just better running the battery too. But can you hear me now, probably? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yep. I got a delay. What's going on? Um, anyway, basically, what it costs you to go to a pub these days is just so damn expensive. That's that's the biggest yeah. killer. And if, yeah. if they're going to go out, it's going to be great. It can't be, it can't be like a pub. It's got to be great. And uh, I was yeah, talking to Trump and uh, you know, it took you a little place. But a classic example was, I was saying all this stuff to Trump. I was in Darwin and had a bar called the Tap Bar in Darwin. And they didn't tough, have toughy, TV. Mate. Tough, tough, tough. It was packed all about 10. And then they got... Tough, hold your, <laughs> tough, hold your... Tuffy, hold your microphone Who's a bit that? closer. We're losing your vocal, mate. Hold your microphone closer. Like you call more stable? Oh, yeah, sorry, I dropped it down. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, okay. Uh, that's about called the tap bar. Is that better? Yeah. Yep. Everyone, everyone's breaking up. It's all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, I don't know, if it beats going. It's going on the feed. Can you hear me okay? Give us a thumbs up if you can hear me all right. No thumbs up. <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay. I think we're out. I think that's it. You're both frozen. No, you're uh, good, mate. We can hear you. <laughs> I got a thumb eventually for Glenn. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we should end it, mate. It's going, going haywire. Okay. Yeah, we've lost your, your signal's going a bit crazy there, Anyone mate. Anyone can talk? Yeah, um, t Glenn, mate, um, I think we should do this, if you don't mind, yeah. in a number sure. of weeks' yep. times again. Sure. And, um, and Tuff, thanks for, for yep. getting in here. Folks, a few things I want to promote. One is that I've got my show coming up at Hotel Metropole on the 13th yeah. of April. It's my 70s unplugged show. Please message me for tickets for that. Tuffy and I are going to be at the full moon on the last Saturday of this month, Easter Saturday. Uh, we kick off at eight o'clock. Glenn, for anyone who's watching down Sydney, Next we get some, yeah. but 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 mate, anything you want to plug you're doing? Ah, uh, no, I'm just doing my usual gigs. I'm doing tomorrow night at uh, in the city at a place called the Three Wise Monkeys in Sydney, folks. Thursday at Scruffy Murphy's, Friday at NBC Sports Club, Saturday NBC Sports Club, Sunday at the DY Bowling Club. <laughs> <laughs> and and seeing as seeing as Tuffy's um internet is freezing and carrying on a bit, I'd like to promote the fact that he does do um like private parties for divorcees and all that stuff like that. And we we are happy to prostitute him out for anything that, that, that makes money for Glenn and I. We will we will manage that situation. Um uh, <laughs> that that's for especially divorce parties. Yeah. <laughs> oh your internet is working suddenly. There we go. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, great, great to talk to yeah. you, brothers. Thank you very oh, much. Um, it's all over the place good to see you guys. Yeah, hopefully a few people see this thing and we'll keep powering on what we're doing. But yeah, uh, see, God bless, see you, God, see you, mate. God bless our music industry, and we'll keep um, doing what we do. Thanks, Glenn. See it's it's tough. See you later. Love see you guys. Bye. See you, mate. <laughs> see you, mate. Bye. See ya.
There you go. Oh, God. 